Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. So I was an undergraduate here at MIT, and I majored in mechanical engineering. Um, but throughout the whole time that I was an undergraduate, I knew that I wanted to do international development work. Um, I had gone to India as a young child with my family, and I think just as a, as a young kid, it struck me that there were a lot of children in the world who you know, didn't have enough to eat, didn't have enough you know, to, to live healthy lives. And so I think from a very early age, it, just, um, it struck me that I wanted to do something about it. So what I did was while I was, um, you know, my sort of career goal as an undergraduate here was to join the Peace Corps and to get started in international development work. Um, and so I, I joined the Peace Corps and I was teaching while I was over there. And, um, but I realized that I really missed the engineering. So I came back to get a master's degree um, in order so that I could apply some of the design engineering that I really love doing to the field of uh, international development. And that's really what got me started. As a graduate student, I, I was a teaching assistant for a lot of the design classes. And I realized that this type of um, this type of design challenge was perfect for students in that it was a good size, a good scope, um, and it also emphasized things that are really important. Uh, things like should, the design should be simple, they should be easy to use, easy to repair, low cost, and those were, um, I think, traits that should be emphasized in design no matter who you're designing for. And so I really got interested in the idea of using these design projects um, as a vehicle for teaching design to MIT students, and that's sort of where things started. And I, I um, you know, as a graduate student, I applied for some funding to teach a class uh, that was about design for developing countries. And then that expanded a little bit where the, you know, instead of just being in the classroom, we started traveling with the students. And, you know, this was still as a, a graduate student, a lot of it. Um, and, you know, I really, I, I felt like MIT could be doing more in this area. So I just sort of kept chinking away. And, um, you know, over time, the, there was, was an evolution. and. We now have 16 different classes, nearly 400 students going through the program. Initially, you know, a lot of the technologies and uh, products were things that I worked on, you know, for my own research. And then that evolved into providing opportunities for MIT students to do the design and development. And then that's evolved to, you know, um, to inviting community partners and you know, to do sort of design training in the field. And then that evolved from, you know, working with local artisans to working with just, you know, pretty much anyone in the village. And that's what we're doing now is trying to foster innovation everywhere with everyone. So um, D-Lab is sort of uh, most generally about development, design, and dissemination. But a couple of other important things are um, dialogue and discovery. So the classes that we teach focus on those first three. Uh, and some focus on sort of development theory and practice. Others are designing technologies. And others are about how do you disseminate those technologies. But we feel that underlying that, um, dialogue and discovery are really important in that we want our students to talk to community partners and um, and really learn from them and listen and work with them and also we feel like it's important for them to you know discover things to learn um, if they're designing a water pump they should know what it's like to carry water on their head if they're designing a, a grain mill they should know what it's like to grind grain in a mortar and pestle and and so we try to provide those experiences both in the classroom and in the lab so we do a lot of hands-on experiential learning in class they um, we try to teach students what they need to know so that they have a good toolkit when they go into the field. So they all learn how to do water treatment and testing. They all learn how to do um, make charcoal from agricultural waste. They learn about 20 different agricultural processing technologies. But we also want them to, you know, 
gain some empathy so they'll um, over the course of the semester there'll be a week where they're living on two dollars a day and trying to experience a little bit what it's like to live in um, you know with just uh, a lot of demands on limited resources and so that's um, I, th I think in a nutshell what we really try to do is is uh, capture experiential learning whether it be literally hands-on learning or whether it be you know gaining empathy through experiences and um, and you know every every exercise that we do we try to think can we make this more hands-on can we make it more experiential and you know students they like it um, right. I think that especially here at MIT where so much is theoretical it's nice to have some things that are more visceral I think that creativity and making things is empowering on so many different levels. So I've seen that at, you know, at MIT, just the first time that a student, you know, actually makes something out of metal. I mean, it's, it's transformative. They're like, whoa, I'm an engineer. You know, it's really, it's exciting. And, and we find the same thing in the field. And I, especially in situations where people have been forced into a very dependent situation, for them to all of a sudden be in a position where they they can identify their need and then create the solution to it, not just ask for the solution, not receive the solution, but create the solution, that's really powerful. And, and you know, so when we were working in northern Uganda, we were, um, you know, a lot of people had warned us, you know, don't, you know, don't be upset if people aren't very enthusiastic or whatever. And we found people were extremely en enthusiastic. And I think it was partly because of this ability to take control over their future and to really enact the change for the things that they identified as problems. And so there was, uh, you know, I, it was really rewarding for us because the degree to which our training sort of infiltrated other aspects of, of community life, you know, where, where people were, um, they were being very proactive in not just in technology creation, but in creating institutions that allowed them to, you know, um, to interact with each other, to purchase technologies, et cetera. So it was, oh, it was, you know, really engaging. And that was one of the things that really moved us in this um, direction of really trying to foster innovation at all levels. Um, you know, no matter what the educational background, no matter what the age, no, you know, uh, just it's, it's a real tool to um, get people to believe that they can, you know, make the change that is necessary for their lives to go in the direction they want. And the thing which is, I think, also really interesting is the b majority of the technologies they develop are ones that allow them to earn income. And so in addition to, um, it may, uh, make life easier and sort of save some labor but also it has the opportunity to provide income so that they can either provide a service or a, a good um, based on the technology and that of course is you know is great because it provides sustainable livelihoods that you know they've developed the technology themselves they know how to fix it they know how to adapt it and it leads to some way that they can be earning money either you know there's one uh, young gentleman who's making rat traps these days and he has four or five different designs of, of traps. These are the traps that um, that Patrick made. Um, this was the practice one where he was still learning what to do and this was his second one where he very clearly figured it out. And the thing that was really interesting about this is that um, so Patrick had seen these before and knew that he wanted to make um, rat traps but he uh, there was no wire in his village so what he did was he actually took an old car tire and burnt the rubber off of it and extracted the wire in order to make these traps and he now has I think three or four different designs not just this type but um, but other types as well and in an area where rats probably uh, they probably eat probably between 20 and 25 percent of the stored grain you know it's it's a it's a concern you know I'm a vegetarian and kind of wish they weren't killing rats, but I understand why why they need to. And um, yeah, but but I think that this is just sort of uh, you know indicative of the the type of thing that happens is that there's a need. Um, he wanted to uh, he wanted to try to meet it. There weren't locally available materials, so he found a way to make it happen. And you know, and I just love you know I love looking at this one, which is so rough, you know, yeah. and then. Not the much later, right, yeah, yeah, there's this one, which is really beautiful. B-Lab Classroom, and I'll show you a little bit about the charcoal project. Um, so you start with a 55-gallon oil drum that we've specially cut holes in, and, um, and what you do is you can start with a corn cob or with um, stalks like sugarcane waste or uh, 
uh, corn stalks, of any of our variety of agricultural waste materials and then by burning them in an oil drum like this and then covering it up so that oxygen can't get in anymore then it carbonizes. So here this was from class the other day and you can see this is uh, corn cobs that we carbonized so they're uh, fully fully made into um, charcoal but these are pretty lightweight and so we would need to crush them and form them into briquettes in order for them to burn properly. And these are some of the technologies that we developed for doing that. This is one of the first technologies that we made and it's pretty uh, straightforward. The way that it works is you scoop some material in here. Thank you. And then hit the plunger. Tap it here. Give it one more tap. And you get a charcoal briquette. And so this is one of the technologies that we developed and we took it into the field and we were very excited with it. it um, this replaced, uh, this is about 25 to 30 dollars and it replaced an 8,000 dollar piece of equipment. So that we thought we had done a great job and people told us, nope, it's still too expensive. So we thought about how we could make it cheaper and we basically got rid of everything. And so this is what we use now. And it's a very simple, tiny piece of technology, but it works great. And what you do is you use it to scoop up some charcoal. Again, we have a little plunger that we use. And again, here's the briquette. And one of the things that I love about this technology is that um, I think it exemplifies the fact that you can keep simplifying and simplifying and it gets you to a better product. So this one was more expensive and you can make about seven or eight briquettes per minute. This one is 10 times cheaper and we can make 10 to 12 briquettes per minute. So it's not only cheaper, it's also better and easier to use. Awesome. So I, I use this as an example of sort of what you should try um, to get to in the design process, something that's simple, elegant, inexpensive, and does the job. This is another technology that we've been working on at D-Lab. Um, and it's uh, a way to shell corn. Uh, and this is a very simple plastic device that you can use to remove the kernels uh, from an ear of corn. And you can see how fast it is. Right? People love this device, but the problem is that you can't make this yourself, right? This is an injection molded piece of plastic. So what we've done is we've developed the tooling that allows you to, um, to make your own corn sheller. And so these are corn shellers that you can make out of sheet metal so that you can use a, a small, a small jig that we made, which is right here, um, in order to make that. But you can even use things like um, tin cans. To, um, to make it and so this is something that we'll um, often teach people how to make and then they you know they can come up with all sorts of different designs which allows uh, for the um, fast removal of kernels from a corn cob. Yes. So we've developed a few different uh, water technologies. So some of them are for testing water and some of them are for treating water. Um, I'll start with the water testing technologies. Um, and uh, that came out of sort of a couple of things. One is uh, that we, uh, we found that a lot of times communities have access to a variety of water sources, but they don't know which ones are safe. And so if you're able to test water yourself, then you can identify a safe water source versus an unsafe water source. And in multiple times we would be in communities where I know one village in Uganda was being very careful about drinking the spring water from the mountains and using the shallow well water for washing. But it turned out that the shallow water was clean and the spring water was dirty and that if they had just been able to know that, they would um, be able 
people to be drinking the safe water and washing with the um, less uh, clean water. So, um, so we developed a few different technologies to allow you to do water quality testing. Uh, one of the ways that you can do it is something called membrane filtration and what you do is you pull water through a piece of filter paper so that all the bacteria that was in the water um, goes onto that piece of paper and then you can put that paper um, you can give it some culture medium and then grow it up in an incubator and then the bacteria will grow enough that you can see them and count them and then you know how many bacteria were in your water. Um, this is a device that's a commercially available to, um, to do that type of test and it costs about $800 which is a lot. So we decided, could we design something that would do the same thing but be a lot cheaper? So this is the, the D-Lab version and it's based on a, a baby bottle and um, uh, inside of it there's a, a piece of wire mesh and a small rubber gasket and using those you can do essentially the same thing as this but at a fraction of the cost. So I think it costs maybe $13 for this test kit versus $850 for, for this test kit. So that's one of the ways that we um, are able to uh, actually do the test but then you still need to incubate it. And again you have the problem with cost in that most field incubators that are battery operated require um, uh, they cost probably about a thousand dollars and they still somehow require electricity because you need to be able to charge up the battery. So, um, so we've developed a uh, low-cost incubator that uses the change of phases of a chemical in order to maintain temperature. So you can actually heat it up using a variety of methods. You can um, so you start with a material like this um, and you can heat this up either by pouring boiling water over it or by putting it in the sun if it's hot out and the melting temperature of this material is 30 to two, sorry, 37 degrees centigrade which is about 98 degrees Fahrenheit which is human body temperature and that's the temperature that you need in order to grow up the samples of the water quality testing um, supplies. You can take these pouches and you can melt them and then as the material starts to recrystallize it becomes a little bit milky like this and then you know it's at the melting temperature which is exactly the temperature that you need to maintain in order to do the water quality tests. So we can put these into just a regular cooler and if you have enough of them it will keep the samples warm for 24 hours which is exactly what you need in order to test whether the water is safe or not. And so that allows communities without electricity to be able to do water quality testing um, sort of in their own with um, in a without even having a field laboratory you can do it just um, anywhere in the field so this is a technology which um, which we've developed over several years at DLAP um, but it doesn't help a lot if you know what, that your water is contaminated if you can't do anything to treat it so we've worked on a few things um, to help uh, with that. This is a, a bag which can be used for disinfecting water just uh, using the sun. So the combination of heat and UV that comes from uh, the sun is uh, an effective way to treat water and a couple million people in the world actually use what's called SOTUS for solar disinfection as a way to treat their water and typically people uh, put water in empty two liter bottles and then put that out in the sun. But the thing about two liter bottles is they're quite thick and so the, um, the UV has to penetrate uh, almost three or four inches. Whereas if you have the water in a plastic bag, uh, the surface area is greater and the depth is less. And one of my former students developed a really neat valve which allows you to put water in and take it back out again. So this is a special valve that's been designed so that you can pour the water in and then it seals. And the neat thing, this is not a, a new invention, but the great thing about, that is the unique invention, is that there's a valve within a valve, so you can pull this valve out, and then that allows you to pour the water out of the bag for the amount that you want to use, and then you can just seal it up again. And so this is a, um, a way that you can, a low cost way that you can treat water. Another thing that we've worked on, and again, these are um, sort of using known scientific principles, but creating low-cost chlorine generators. So just using the electrodes from used batteries, if you can run a current through them and um, 
uh, put them in salt water, you'll actually generate chlorine. And then um, if you put about a teaspoon of salt in w this much water and run uh, five volts um, of current through it, within about 10 minutes, you'll have enough of chlorine solution that can treat a full jerry can full of water. So these are a bunch of the water technologies. And we have a number of people at MIT um, who develop other, other types of water treatment technologies. Uh, we have a colleague, Susan Murcott, who's developing ceramic filters uh, similar to this uh, in northern Ghana. And um, yeah, so there's a, a lot of interest in water technologies in the D-Lab program and throughout MIT. So this is where we have some of the bigger technologies and some of these are ones that students have developed and some of them are things that we've collected from the field. So this is a pedal powered corn sheller which uh, allows you to do the same thing as the corn shellers that you just saw but with a pedal powered device and um, this device has existed for a while so we didn't design this but what the students did design is a great way to fit it on the back of a bicycle and so that way you can actually um, ride ride the bicycle to the farm and process the corn um, at the farm. Yeah. And, and, uh... Okay, so this can uh, shell corn a lot faster than by hand and um, yeah, and normally you would have a bag there that, that catches it. Um, some other pedal power things that students have designed, this is a portable pedal powered washing machine. So inside here there's a a uh, inner drum and an outer drum. The inner drum is made out of wood and twine that um, that's where you'd put the clothes and then you can pour water and soap in and then oh, hop on board and there's actually you can change gears so you can have a spin cycle as well as a, a rinse cycle. Uh, let's see this is a pedal powered hacksaw which was developed by our friend Bernard in Tanzania um, and it's an amazing device and Bernard is actually developing all sorts of pedal powered tools for his workshop so he's got a pedal powered drill press, the hacksaw, he's looking at doing a grinder and some other things as well. Um, this is an early prototype of a lever powered wheelchair that was designed by a um, graduate student who is soon going to become a professor here at MIT and uh, right here we have a pedal powered grain mill which was designed by our friend uh, Carlos in uh, Guatemala. Oh, yeah. So this is from Maya Pedal. It, it does change a lot of people's perceptions especially you know women in the developing world aren't often the people who are making things with tools and um, I remember we were talking to one woman um, uh, just to sort of see some of the effects of the various uh, workshops that we had done and we asked you know if this chair were broken would you be able to fix it and she said oh of course and then we asked would you be able to do it before um, the training oh no I feared the hammer you know and and you know she doesn't fear the hammer anymore she's the person who makes these you know threshing tables and if anyone wants to learn how to do it they go and they talk to her Yeah, so one of the things that I'm really interested in now is looking at, uh, so there's sort of these relief efforts which come in um, and, uh, and one of the things that I find really interesting is are there ways that we could redesign some of the ways that relief is practiced so that it like better the, leads to um, long-term sustainable development. And so I recently just ran a, a conference where we thought about that a little bit and um, thought about designing some things in that realm. But that's something that I'm very interested in and also interested in how this you know, creative capacity building can happen in that context. And you know, there's a real, um, you know, there's a real uh, tension between, you know, sort of the immediacy of saving lives now and what that means and the infrastructure you need for that versus, you know, what's, what's going to happen 10, 15, 20 years out. Um, and, uh, and I believe that there could be some clever things from a design and technology point of view that could make that transition a better transition. So that's an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and then the other thing is I, I am 
Uh, I continue to be incredibly excited about the idea of, you know, um, innovation and creativity being uh, tools for development and that we honor and appreciate the, that spark that's in everybody and, you know, rather than sort of donating things, we uh, find a way to uh, sort of nurture that spark and have people create the things for their, you know, their own well-being. Yeah. It's a big problem, you know, pro amputees in the developing world, there's plenty of people that have been amputated across all age ranges. Um, we want to approach the problem as a technological problem and one where we can incorporate a lot of new technologies to find a way to make very low cost, high quality prostheses. Our typical approach right now technologically is to build uh, ankles and knees. Uh, for example, this is a knee that we've been developing. And it has a locking mechanism that allows it to lock and swing and then also land on the ground during heel strike. This is called the, the Stanford knee. So this is a relatively advanced knee for the developing world. What a lot of people get now in some places in the developing world, for example, South America, this is an International Red Cross knee. And what's interesting here is actually it's made of very cheap components. Uh, it's a metal rod. This is high density polyethylene? Mm -hmm. I think, no, it's not the polypropylene. Sorry, so this is polypropylene, and this is a rubber foot. So this is distributed and sold at about $100, I think, yeah, uh, in uh, Nicaragua, for example, uh, which is actually pretty expensive for the developing world. So if you look at it, uh, again, things are different in different developing countries. So we have things in India, for example. This is called the, the Japer foot, produced by the Japer foot organization in India, and it's a rubber foot. Uh, and this is kind of the standard right now, except for this knee part right here. This is high density, poly, um, high density polyethylene, HDPE, and the reason we use it is because it's very available, it's cheap, it's easy to form. You know, this is handmade foot, uh, this is all handmade also. Um, you know, a very simple uh, manufacturing process where you have, a, involves a lot of local people, it employs a lot of people also, um, and by this organization. But we also want to do some innovation. You know, we want to have some sort of innovative designs here. So Ken Endo actually developed an exo knee, which is a, a knee stance lock mechanism. So the way it works is that it swings, and then it can land at any angle, and then stick there. This solves a big issue yeah. that a lot of amputees have. They fall a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So from beginning to end, it's us going there. You know, we come from MIT. We visit a clinic. And there's a group of prosthetists, people that are sort of trained to fit prosthetics, and they're local. So they're in part of whatever community is out there serving them. Um, they also hire a lot of people. I, think, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if they're paid or they're volunteers. At the they're paid, of course. Okay. Yes. So they're paid at the J. Ford organization by the number of uh, legs they fit. So they, it's this group of people that are locals. Um, there's some more experienced people that are, for example, we have a collaborator there who has an, a is a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, who works in some of these clinics. And then they have us, who are researchers, kind of all working together to do a few things. You know, we're trying to fit as many people as possible, of course, and we're trying to make it really high quality. Mm -hmm. um, so the process begins where they come to a clinic from wherever they are, um, and they come into a, a waiting room, and they take physiological measurements. Uh, they figure out what is the length of the stump, how much bone do you have to work okay. with. Uh, is a big one of the key things. And then once you know how l much bone you have to work with, you can start using plaster or something like that to get a shape, a mold of the uh, process of the stump. Um, so once you have a mold, um, you can start putting together something like this. You know, you can start filling it with high, de uh, with, uh, I think they use high density polyethylene yes. for the socket. And then you can, it's, you know, very, uh, it's actually pretty nice. Pretty, it's pretty much the same thing we do in the, in the United States. We use plaster also, and, and it's, just a great, uh, it's just a great material to work with, and it's readily available. Um, so once you do that, you have like maybe one or two people working with each patient, and these guys are uh, going to make a custom leg, you know, that kind of looks like their able-bodied uh, leg if they have a single amputation, kind of make the foot that looks similar so that it looks about right. And that turns out to be a really big issue because you, will, you don't want to have an obvious amputation if you're going to go look for work. Yes. So the whole chain and the whole time it takes, I think you, know, you can make 
a full prosthesis in under a day. So it's a very fast turnaround. And, you know, some of these clinics see, you know, probably like 20 people a day sometimes, and it's it depends. The clinic, yes. the, yeah. It's the size of the clinic is different from the place to place. So Jaipur Food has a 16 right. clinic all over the India. Yeah. And so, uh, for example, Jaipur, the clinic in Jaipur is the biggest one, and they accept uh, more than 200 sometimes per day, and they feed the prosthetic device to the people right. every day. Right. You know, what you see a lot is uh, amputees are, you know, there are a lot of young men. Um, they work in factories, they work on trains, you know, they lose their limbs. It's, this is India in particular. A lot of young men and they can't work. They can't bring money home for their families. So it becomes an employment issue, uh, which feeds obviously into quality of life issues. So, um, you know, just that quick point that, you know, it's a balance issue and it means that nobody will hire you because you're a liability. So, what, you know, the whole point of this is of, doing, of developing this technology that solves a, a big issue around poverty, which is that as soon as you lose a limb, um, you know, you, you don't have this, can't work as a laborer. You're in a wheelchair, you hardly ever get a wheelchair. Uh, so, you're, you're stuck with v moving around with whatever you can find. Exactly. Yeah, of course, in India, so one kid lost his leg and he, he used a motorcycle and get accident, he got he got lost his leg. But after getting the prosthetic limb, he he's he's like going back to his job. He's an entertainer <laughs> using motorcycle, and driving oh on the sphere yes. sphere yes. cage inside it. Yes, yeah, getting the money from the audience. That, so yeah, this is extreme extreme example. But that yes. happened to the every kind of the field in yeah. India. So yes. Prosthetic is yes. just technology. Yes. I think we can. Uh, we can we can enable the disabled person walk or walk more. Also, but, but the, I think the more important thing is uh, making the quality of the life better. Mm. Yes. Making the leg is not only the physical condition, but also the emotional things are more important. Uh. Right, we work with the Jaipur Food Organization in India and that's because they have a pretty well established network and chain of clinics there. Uh, in other countries things aren't, the infrastructure is not nearly as well developed and we have a collaboration with the National Rehabilitation Institute in Sierra Leone where we want to set up a research lab there to figure out how to set up clinics where we can distribute prostheses. We're doing the same thing in Nicaragua yeah. and we're also I think now looking into working with um, Cambodia also. And the idea here is that we this, our class that we've been teaching at D-Lab for a while um, allows us to build a lot of technology that we can turn into a platform and a framework that we can apply anywhere. And we, through these partnerships, you know, it has two obvious advantages. It gives us a source of funding, you know, some way to kind of get uh, them on board too, you know, for their own population. And I think it's really important to develop that relationship. Um, you know, you hear a lot about people going in and trying to, you know, affect change in, develop, in developing countries and not getting very far because they're sort of forcing their will on people. By making them a partner, we can sort of improve the dissemination process. Right. Well, you know, there's tons of enthusiasm around campus everywhere. And yes. when, as soon as you tell people about this project, they really right. get it. Yes. And that's what uh, really is, is exciting for us too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the biggest problem is, you know, like Ken said, it's just bringing the people, you know, people bringing them in and then having them stay involved for a long for a period of time. time. Right. right. I think funding is always a challenge for us. Um, for us, we have a lot of money for traveling. We have less money for supplies and for building our own infrastructure. And I think that's one of the really ironic things because traveling is you know, traveling and making a good impression is only the beginning. Yeah. And I think there's this long-term sort of funding problem within with what we're doing, where people uh, need to fund more kind of as we develop, and to look at us as more than just a one stage. Let's visit and make a good impression we need to think about, well, five years down the line, where we want to be. Exactly. So that sort of funding is hard to come by. The funding that we find it's easy to come by is, well, we, we'll, we'll pay for plane tickets sort of funding. <laughs> I 
Hi, my name is Anna Young. I'm here with Innovations in International Health and D-Lab at MIT. Uh, we design medical technologies for developing countries um, and actually with the people who are going to be using them, whether that's doctors, nurses, or patients. One of the interesting projects we have going on at the lab right now is a solar autoclave. You're looking at half of it. Uh, solar autoclaves are used for sterilization of medical instruments in areas that don't have access to typical autoclaves, which require either a fuel source or electricity. So what we've done is decoupled the sterilization from the power supply. The reflector right here is the power supply, and um, we have a quadrant of, of four of those, and they, what sits right above it is just a regular pressure cooker that you can find anywhere in the world insulated with fiberglass and inside of um, an orange paint bucket. So this works. We've been working with a women's cooperative, Las Mujeres Solares, the solar women in Nicaragua on manufacturing. Um, this reflector right here was actually made by Rumalda and Reina. Um, they're two members of the construction team uh, from this cooperative that works on solar technologies and they spend an afternoon with us building um, this and, and another um, set and we're hoping that ideally um, a year or two from now they will actually be selling these in um, two clinics in Nicaragua as part of their uh, technology, uh, solar technology product line. So we're not only looking at, you know, designing something that is intuitive for a nurse to use in rural areas but also something that local labor and local um, groups can manufacture. This is Cool Comply. It is um, a solar powered low energy cooling device that allows uh, multi drug resistant tuberculosis patients in Ethiopia to keep their medication cold. This is Pazer, one of the um, 10 medications that a patient will be on if they have multi drug resistant tuberculosis, and it needs to be refrigerated. What's happening now is people are either storing these at their neighbor's home and missing doses because they don't want to interrupt them late at night, or they're taking a month's salary to invest in a fridge. And the terrible part is, is the only thing that you'll see in the fridge is the Pazer medication when you go to visit. So Dr. Chris Olson at Mass General Hospital approached us and said, what can we do? What sort of a technology can we develop that will address this and help patients? So this is a cooling device. It uses thermoelectric coolers um, on the inside and has a dispensing mechanism um, for the medication to come out of. Um, so, but along with actually cooling the device, cooling the medication, the device itself sends text messages every time it is being used. So doctors know while the, when their patients are taking their medicine and what the temperature of the of the device is, um, so they can be sure that their patients are following the correct. So a really exciting project in our lab is Medikit, which is medical education design and invention kits. And here we're not designing end solutions for patients and medical professionals, but we're actually designing a platform for them to invent their own solutions. So what you have, um, there's seven different kits and they're each an erector set for medical devices. So instead of getting an airplane or a car at the end of, of using it, you actually get a functioning medical device um, stethoscope that will record to and, and send that um, information wirelessly. One of the kits that we have is the prosthetics kit. So what you're seeing right here is an agricultural prosthetic that a farmer in any anywhere around the world can use as a cap over their regular prosthetic. So, you know, if you can imagine if somebody in rural Nicaragua loses their arm and instead of, you know, you can't train them to be an accountant. They need to be able to earn um, their same livelihood. So what we've done, um, Jeff McLeod has designed, is this is a Coke bottle that's actually would be um, thermoformed to fit and um, around the prosthetic uh, stump and then you have this attachment which is secured on at the top. You can see that right there. And then the interesting part, I'll just show you off. This is a bike inner tube. You can find those just about anywhere. And this bike inner tube acts as a gripper. So you can put any sort of, you know, you pump this up and you can put any sort of uh, agricultural or even cooking home tool that you would want to use um, inside of here. And then in the evening you switch it off and put the regular hand back on. Um, so this is, again, part of the Medical Education Design and Invention Kits project, Medikit. Um, the other themes that we have kits for would be the diagnostics, microfluidics, vital signs, and drug delivery kits.
So, as we know, um, you know these solutions that we're, we're, that we're designing right now won't be the same for every country that they're disseminated into. Um, a lot of how we work is actually going and visiting the hospitals, clinics, and health centers in different parts of the world and interviewing and working with doctors or nurses there to see what their biggest struggles are. Um, sometimes people are sharing glucometers and they don't have you know, access to a glucometer, so we look at the, how do you make a cheap color metric diagnostic reader. Um, in Central America, where we do a lot of our work, asthma is a huge issue. So we've looked at how do you power a nebulizer using a bike pump or an alternative air supply. Whereas in some, you know, most countries in Africa don't exactly have the same respiratory issues and some of that has to do with the cooking styles. And, and so all of these things need to be taken into consideration when you're addressing the needs. And instead of, you know, reaching out to um, any list that you find online for the top 10 greatest health challenges, you know, one of the most important things that you can do is actually go and visit these areas and talk to the people and see what you know what are what are their pressing needs and what is keeping them up at night and and how do how are they struggling to, to care for patients because there you're going to find the really interesting challenges that are worthwhile so creative capacity building is our attempt to democratize innovation so instead of looking at MIT as a place where new inventions come from and then we take them out to the world, instead we want to figure out how we can foster local innovation. Uh, the process of creative capacity building really started with one of the events that Amy Smith and Ben Linder and others founded called the International Development Design Summit. And that is a, a space where many people from, that we've met through the course of our D-Lab trips, as well as others, were brought together, farmers, doctors, students, uh, uh, bike mechanics, a variety of people, uh, come together to design and learn uh, the design process that we would, we would use uh, if we were developing a technology. And so that was really the seed of how do you create local innovators and that started this, this ongoing search for appropriate venues in which we could to, to do that kind of training beyond the classroom. In 2009, we were approached by the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, which was doing work in northern Uganda, in the, in the area that was most devastated by the Civil War there. Um, they, the, just briefly on on northern Uganda, it was a brutal civil war. Over 1.3 million people were killed, uh, and millions of people, over two million people, were displaced into and and rounded up into camps that were supposed to be for their safety. wasn't necessarily safer in the government camps than being outside. But the people were caught in the middle, and this conflict lasted for over 20 years. The UUSC approached us just after peace had broken out and people were starting to leave the camps for internally displaced people or IDP camps and were going back to their original villages. And one of the big concerns was that although the camps were very difficult and overcrowded and declared by the United Nations to be one of the worst humanitarian situations in the world, uh, one advantage of being in the camps was that all of the resources were centralized and that now that people were going home, they were dispersed and resources were far apart and a lot of that work uh, of filling the gap, whether it was collecting water or collecting firewood, um, doing all of the farming, all of, all of, a lot of that would fall on women. And so UUSC contacted Amy and uh, asked if we would go and do a training in which we would demonstrate some of the technologies that we use here in D-Lab and we teach our students. And so we went. What we, while we were there, um, it was clear that there were not a lot of resources, that if we showed somebody how a technology, it would have been very difficult for people in these remote areas to access the supplies that would be necessary or, or, or a merchant or a market to buy these things and we really thought that the best strategy would be to actually teach people how to make things themselves based upon what they had available to them. So we began by essentially taking components of that IGDS curriculum, one where we were teaching people for five weeks and instead 
uh, uh, crushed it down into one week uh, of training. In fact, it was a three-day training initially. And in that three-day training, we taught people the basics of the design process. And so that's the origin of creative capacity building. The, the essential concept is that we may be quote unquote experts in the development of technology, but people who are farmers in rural communities are experts in farming. People who are women who are running their households are experts in running their households. We are not the experts in that. And really great technologies come from this combination of knowledge about a situation and, and what you need to do to make a technology work and then some mechanics on how to, how to put it together and that if we could get across this design process and teach some of the basic mechanics that people could uh, design their own technologies. And that would be a, a, an important way for some of these technologies to get out into areas that are often difficult to reach through traditional supply chains. Uh, so that is the, the, the essence of creative capacity building. So what was very interesting about doing this work in, in, a, in an area where there was such devastation and, and there had been the, uh, the, that international relief agencies and humanitarian organizations had been there for some time, was that we were told that we shouldn't expect very much. We were told that people would be uh, passive, that people would be expecting us to just give them things, that people essentially were dependent on these agencies and that even though we were all excited, we shouldn't have high expectations. And in fact, we found the complete opposite. When we began our trainings, people were enthusiastic. Ideas were coming from left and right, and people really loved the training. And in fact, as I said, on our first trip, we went to demonstrate technologies. It was the enthusiasm of people that made us on the spot commit to come back and to develop a new curriculum that would really focus on teaching. And so <clears throat> our experience was that people are hungry to not be dependent. People are hungry to be self-sufficient. People ache for the opportunity to contribute their knowledge, contribute their skills, to learn new skills, to be self-sufficient, as I said. So uh, we, we definitely had a different experience than, than what people uh, asked us, uh, or, or rather uh, prepared us um, for. Um, and it, it, that's not to say that this is a panacea. This is a very, there's very, very complicated uh, dynamics in, in extreme poverty wherever you deal with it. Uh, we're excited about creative capacity building because it does represent a shift in focus and a shift in perspective. Again, so things are not so much coming from uh, MIT and going outward, but rather the development professional or the way that we train our, our, our or the technical uh, uh, advisor is instead seen as someone who facilitates the actions and the abilities and the creativity of other people and asks people to be uh, in charge of their own development. And, and so we, we like that shift. We like to share that shift with our students. We have very, very talented students who are some of the smartest kids in the country and they're used to being right all the time. And so to ask them to go into uh, communities, work with communities, and start to view themselves as contributors to a process and collaborators as opposed to someone who's providing all the answers is I think a significant shift. And that's what we really like about creative capacity building. So the way that we uh, designed the curriculum was to be, we had to be co cognizant of the fact that everybody does not share the same educational background. Many of the people that we're working with have no formal education, some do not uh, write, some do not read. And so it was very important that our curriculum be oral and that it be hands-on. Everything was done in translation. So Amy or, uh, and, and I would uh, speak whatever we were talking about in, in English. And then one of our, uh, our, our, trans our interpreters from the organization that we partnered with, Caritas, would translate simultaneously or interpret simultaneously. And so it was, it was the way that we designed a lot of the, the lessons was to have people use things that were familiar to them. Mm -hmm. one of, an example of, of one way that we talked about the iterative, iterative design process 
uh, was we used the charcoal press. And the charcoal press is, uh, uh, you, you saw Amy um, demonstrate the charcoal press. And you have the first one or two designs that we did and we could show that in each step of the design process, it, essentially we started with the same problem and that we went through the design process and we came up with a solution. Then we got feedback and we went around the same design cycle again and we came up with a better solution. And then even that solution wasn't good enough and we went around again and eliminated a lot of the material and came up with a simple, <laughs> elegant design after going through the process again and again. And that's because a lot of times when people want to make something, they just go and make it and they stay with what they've made. If it works, they, they stay with it. Um, and so showing people with something that they could see and that they could touch and they can try out um, was a good way for us to explain that iterative design process. Another way that we uh, try to um, give people an opportunity to go through the cycle, the entire cycle, but with very uh, affordable materials was we challenged people to balance a certain number of maize mm -hmm. uh, cobs or corn cobs uh, six inches off the ground only using two sheets of paper. Uh, paper is affordable, doesn't cost a lot, people are more uh, willing to experiment and tear and rip and, and it's not expensive, it's not wood, it's not metal, it's not something that people necessarily would need. Um, and this has become a, a fun and um, you know, people are enthusiastic about, and, and com it's a competition. How, how many maize uh, cobs can I balance? And some group will get 10 or 13 or 15. One group got 23 and people are very excited and just on two sheets of paper. But in addition to it being fun, people are experimenting. People are trying different designs. People are thinking of lots of ideas and trying those out. Uh, and I think what's also significant is when you first explain it and you say, balance on two sheets of paper, people look at you like you're crazy. Right. And they say, well, how am I possibly going to do this? And so then when you move from that phase to seeing people actually balancing things on just two sheets of paper, you understand what's possible. You understand that you can initially think something's not going to work and that going through a process can reveal things to, to you that you didn't know previously. And everything that we do in the training is a hands-on exercise. The challenges, so we no, don't just explain the process, but we also will uh, give a design challenge at the beginning based upon something that people do in that community. So in one community it was picking mangoes. So one team of four or five students, uh, four or five participants would be challenged with designing a mango picker and they would have to identify the problems that are associated with picking mangoes. So if you're just climbing trees or you're throwing rocks at it or things are falling on your head or dangerous, dirty, whatever the issues are, how does your design uh, avoid or address uh, those problems, or right? what are your design specifications? Right? We, we, we'll, we'll take something like design specifications and break it down to something very simple like what is the problem and how is your machine going to address those problems? What do you need your machine to be able to do? Um, mango pickers, rice, uh, um, ground nut threshers, so ground nuts or peanuts, uh, taking them off the plant. Um, very simple devices that people can prototype relatively quickly. And so we provide these challenges and in the course of the three-day training, people will not only learn the process that we, and, and see the examples and learn about the technologies that we're showing them, but they'll also be designing their own. So by the, by the end of the training, people have designed a prototype and they can say, I've made this thing. Um, and, I, and one of the other, one of my favorite exercises is also uh, Amy, and, Amy uh, and I worked on a prototype for uh, making peanut butter, essentially. Sesame paste uh, or, or, or peanut butter. And we used this particular prototype that, that we made in this phase where we asked people to uh, give feedback and evaluate a technology, right? So user feedback phase of the design cycle. And frequently what will happen is People will look at this prototype and they'll like it, but then they'll quickly see it would be better if it had handles, mm -hmm. it'll be more comfortable if you maybe lower it. A lot of the women will say, wait a minute, that's too high because we wear skirts. Um, you'll get all kinds of feedback and, 
And then in that process, the community is seeing, wait a minute, this is the MIT design and we're making it better. And you, again, this principle that we are not the experts. You know what you need in your life and all you need is a bit of a framework. And that's what creative capacity building is. It's a framework. And the last thing I'll say about creative capacity building is that it, it is, I think, an embodiment of how everything in here at D-Lab works as far as what we want, how we want to train our students to work with people. It's, it's with. You're working with people and you have to do so with respect. And it's not just lip service. Right. If you really respect people and you respect the fact that people can contribute to their own uh, development and their own progress, then you have to develop a process that allows you to listen to people, that allows people to understand that you are very interested in their ideas, that gives them space to try things and experiment, the same things that we would do uh, with, with any other kind of educational process. Um, and that people understand that you're in it with them, that it's not an experiment on them or you're not just giving something and going away, um, but that together you're trying to figure something out. And, and that is what we encourage our students to do. Um, and, and that is, is, is a key principle um, in, in the way that we approach creative capacity building. And that, thing, that, that applies whether you're working in Boston or whether you're working in Botswana, it does not matter. You have to work with people with respect, and that, we think, is critical to any kind of positive development.